Hey, thanks for tuning in to Firmly Rooted. Here's another message from Pastor Tom Donnelly. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Firmly Rooted. My name is Isaac. I am that wedge between Abraham and Jacob. Your sermon theme for today, finding the sacred in our everyday lives. I'm the right one to speak today. They call me a patriarch. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. My life was pretty normal. There aren't chapters and chapters in your book of Genesis covering me. Not like Abraham. Not like my son Jacob. So you sometimes probably wonder in this pursuit of the sacred whether it could ever happen in your life. Is it possible that God would care about you enough to drop into your life and make a difference? It's always got to be somebody else's life. I'm with you. I get it. And sometimes this life can be so hard at times, it's tough to see where God is. So except for the fact that my mom would tell me that I'm a miracle baby. I mean, she was like a hundred when I was born. I struggle to find anything special. I struggle to find the sacred. You met me last week. I was 40 years old, and I am in an arranged marriage. My wife got delivered to me. Her name was Rebecca. Man, I love her. I love her. Did I say I was 40 when I got married? I was 40. She and I wanted children. but she wasn't having one. So I did what my father taught me, and I prayed. And I prayed. And I prayed. And I prayed. And still no children. Ever been there? I hear that you Americans, you can drive through a restaurant and get your food in a minute and a half. If you think God works like that, you're kidding yourself. 20 years. 20 years. I prayed. 20 years. I prayed. And finally, finally, she's gifted. And she becomes pregnant. 20 years. Trying to find the sacred in those 20 years. Try to find God's hand and his ear and anything when he seems to be a million miles from your requests. But my father taught me there was nothing else to do. My father taught me there was, what else would I do? What is my other option? I heard the stories my father told. He took me to places when these things took place. I was on that mountain when he almost sacrificed me. I watched God provide that ram instead of me. I was the one that was tied down and the knife was over my body. I am that one. All I could do was pray. 20 years. So you're saying to yourself, finally, Isaac. I now know why God called me Isaac, by the way. What does Isaac mean? Laughter. I had to find a reason to laugh. So she's finally pregnant. And it's a troubled pregnancy. 
really, 20 years. Now my wife's talking to me about the fact that something's going on that she doesn't understand. She doesn't like it. There's something. There's something going on that's no good, not right. Something. She senses it. She senses it. She's finally pregnant, and we got what we want, and now it's not the way it's supposed to be. So, uh, ah! I thought, I thought I had saw the sacred until she shared that with me. So she begins to pray. Lord, what's going on inside of me? I've talked to all the women who have had kids before, and none of them are experiencing what I'm experiencing. None of them. And God says to her, there are two nations inside your womb. You're going to have twin boys, and life's not going to be easy. Those boys are going to despise each other. Those boys are going to be angry with each other. Those boys are going to have a rough time. And oh, by the way, the older will serve the younger. It's just not the way things are in our society. The firstborn male, he's the... No, that's not the way it's going to be. The younger. Any of you with me? <laughs> how do you navigate? How do you navigate through a world in which you're been told by those above you, your seniors, Abraham, that, that God's a provider God, that he'll meet your needs, he'll be there, he'll protect you, and as you've lived out your life, it, it, it's been good, but man, there are these like wrestling matches, these, these moments in time, these, these things going on. What do you do with them? Where do you place the puzzle piece? I'll never forget the day they were born. God was right. They couldn't have been any different. Esau, the firstborn, came out all hairy. He came out, man, he's like a full-grown man, had a beard and everything, just born. <laughs> and Jacob, he came out like with no hair. It's like Esau had it all. But so strange, so strange, that Jacob, he came out grabbing the heel of his brother Esau. The midwives said no one had ever seen anything like that before. No one had ever seen anything like that before. Where one was physically attached to the other as they were racing to come out of the womb. My wife told me about her conversation with God. I remembered in the back of my mind this idea that the younger would, would be served by the older. But can I tell you something? Esau was my favorite. I loved Esau. He was like a man after my own heart. Jacob was a mama's boy. I had trouble loving Jacob. I know they're both mine. But she just coddled him and coddled him and coddled him. She never listened to me. I knew what that kid needed. But on the other hand, Esau in his wildness was doing stuff he shouldn't do, ends up marrying Canaanite women, and uh, what a mess. I 
I wonder if you've got anything going on in your lives that's at all similar. Where relationships that you thought were supposed to be a blessing are not. Where, where you thought you were going to have some type of physical healing, you're, there's not. Where you thought something was going to be improved or better, it's not. The world seems upside down and it seems backwards. It's like somebody just pulled the rug out from your feet and you're spinning. These boys, they bickered and bickered and fought all the time. That red stew incident, they were adult men. They weren't 12-year-old boys. It never ended. Birthrights over food. This constant jostling that happened in the womb continued to happen outside of the womb. It was never ending. Rebecca and I wrestled and wrestled and wrestled as we watched our children grow up. It's not easy. They don't always do things the way you think they should. They seem to have minds of their own. Isn't that crazy? How do you find the sacred in the midst of this journey that has so many bumps and roadblocks and, and things going on? And so now you, you, you finally start to get a settle down. You finally get a little feeling like you hit a norm. Like, okay, it's not great, but it's got like, it's predictable. You ever been there? I mean, just don't let anything else change, God, because this, if this is, I'll deal with this. I can breathe. Then a famine. If you're God's chosen people, why would you be put through a famine? I've got children, I've got a wife, and I've got all these servants, and I've got all these animals, and the crops are all dying, and now God says you've got to leave. You've got to leave your comfort zone. You've got to move over here. So we've got to move over here. Where does he send me? He sends me to Gerar. You guys remember Abimelech? My dad met Abimelech. Remember Abimelech? That's when my dad said that Sarah was his sister. Remember that one? Yeah, I couldn't resist. I did the same thing. Yeah, I did. Again. I mean, I told myself all the way there, I'm not going to do what my dad did. I'm not going to do what my dad did. I'm not going to do what my dad did. And guess what? I do what my dad did. I called my wife, Rebecca, my sister. Until one day Abimelech looked down and saw that I was expressing affection to my sister and said, hey, what's going on with you? And he said, that's my wife. And at least God made Abimelech smart enough not to do the same thing twice. Interesting. God made Abimelech smart enough not to do the same thing twice. Is it possible that God gets in the background and we don't see him? Is it possible that he's there, but we don't see him? Is it possible that the sacred is happening even in the midst of the difficulties of our lives? Is it possible that God is there? For the first time, I began to realize that's not what Abimelech did with my dad. My di Abimelech took my dad's wife, Sarah, to be his wife. But when I came to Gerar, Abimelech did not make the same mistake twice. Only I did. Isn't it great? When the believers are the ones making the mistakes and the foreigners are the ones who get it. I began to think that God is good all the time. And all the time, he's good. I just don't always see it. I don't always see it. So my, son are, my sons are now in their f around 40. Oh. And... Esau, as I said, has married a few foreign women, not making my wife very happy. But I'm getting old. I'm losing my sight. I can't see anymore. It's amazing how much you see when you don't see. It's amazing what God has you ponder when your eyes are closed. 
but I knew my days were coming, and I knew it was time to bless my son. Oh, I know you're going to judge me. I know. I picked Esau, and I told Esau to go fix me some food, to go hunting, find some game, cook it for me, and I'll bless you. Yes, I did that behind my wife's back. Oh, you think living life with God is perfect. You think we all got it covered. I'm Isaac. I'm in the three patriarchs. And yes, I worked behind my wife's back because she would have put Jacob. I know you're saying, but God told her that it was supposed to be Jacob. I know that now, but I didn't believe it then. I wanted my will to be done. So I got Esau in secret. I told Esau to go hunting, and I told him to bring me food, and I said, I'll bless you when you return. But guess who overheard me? Rebecca. So what does Rebecca do? She deceives me, and she goes behind my back. What is it about the human condition? What is it about who we are? Here we are God's people. Here we are God's people, and we're fumbling, and we're stumbling through life. I mean, we're literally throwing each under the bus in our latter years of life because we want our will to be done. So while Esau's out hunting, Rebecca conspires this plan. She goes and gets a couple goats. She takes the skins off the goats and she ties them onto Jacob's arms and around his neck and she makes them hairy. Then she takes some of Esau's clothes and she puts the clothes on Jacob. And Jacob's going, Ma, I don't think we should do this because Dad's going to curse me, not bless me, if he figures this out. And she says, you just listen to me. I'm going to get my will done. By hell or high water, you're going to get this blessing today. Someone comes in the door. Father, who is it? Remember, I can't see. It's Esau, your firstborn. How did you get the food so fast? Oh, Father, the Lord was so generous. He was so gracious, and he, he led me to the kill, and I'm here. Oh, Jacob, you deceiving little weasel. You lied to your father's face. Have you ever lied to your father's face? Don't have to answer. I know. So does he. I just want you to realize, can you relate to my life? If you can relate to my life, then you got to realize that God and the sacred lives in you just as he lives in me. Because this sermon is not about denying the sacred. It's about the fact that he can be and is sacred even in my stupidity. Even in my stumbling walk with him, God is good all the time. And so my son... I say to him, Are, come close. Come close so I can touch you. When I touched him, I could feel the hair. <laughs> I had no idea it was goat's hair. I even said to him, I even said, you have the voice of Jacob, but you feel like Esau. Are you really Esau? I am. Have you ever just willfully did what you wanted to do even though you knew God said no? I have. 
too often? Tom Donnelly. And so is Isaac. You see, sometimes there are consequences to the deceptions we play, the things we allow ourselves to get involved in. The thing plays on. Come here. Give me a kiss. Ever been betrayed by a kiss? Jesus was betrayed by a kiss. Come here and kiss me. And when Jacob kissed me, I smelled the clothes of Esau, and I was certain it was him. So I blessed him. I blessed him as the firstborn. I blessed him with the blessing of God. I blessed him with the very words, now that I think about it, the very words that God told Rebekah were the words that came out of my mouth as I told Jacob that his brothers would serve him and that he would rule them and that he would be greatly blessed and he would bless many. And I blessed him. I blessed Esau. But it was Jacob. It wasn't 45 minutes and another knock on the door. Who is it? It's your son Esau. I've come back from catching the game and I've cooked it and I've prepared it. And so Father, eat and drink and bless me. And the Hebrew says that Isaac trembled. He physically trembled in his bed. In one moment, he caught the deception. In one moment, it all became real and true to him. Esau, your brother Jacob, he deceived me, and I gave him the blessing. But Father, don't you have a blessing for me? Oh, the jostling, the emotions. Esau wants to kill Jacob. So Isaac and Rebekah have to take Jacob and send him away. Go get a wife from Rebekah's family and go away and get away from Esau until he calms down. I'm no longer Isaac. I'm Pastor Tom Donnelly. Where do you find the sacred? I personally love Isaac because there's nobody closer to my life. Manipulations, twists, ugliness, things I didn't expect, things, uh, ugh, I get it. But the question is, can the sacred be found? Because if the sacred can only be found in those like my father, or the sacred can only be found in those like Jacob, who, who <laughs> will, will probably be the, the sermon series continuation of his life, I come to realize that the sacred can be experienced even in the average mundane life. If you just remember to look back. See, as Isaac looks back through a rearview mirror, he realizes that he refused to listen to God's word and he refused to listen to his wife, Rebecca. He realizes that his disobedience to God's word creates a wedge in his marriage. See, God's word is important. Where truth fits is important. You can walk home with as many opinions as you want. You don't walk home with truth, you got a problem. The sacred, first and foremost, is found in a God who is faithful and true. When I look back, He blessed me. Do you know there was a time during that famine when I lived in Gerar that I planted seeds in the land of Gerar and I got a hundredfold? I reaped. A hundred percent more than I planted. 
It's impossible. During that famine time, I was so blessed by God that they sent me away because I was getting too big and too powerful. Boy, if I just would look back, I can see all the things that God did. I could see that Jacob and Esau were a blessing. I could see that my favoritism was a problem, my attitude was a plot problem. I can see the sin, and I can see the grace, and I can experience a God who loves me. With Abraham, my father, I celebrated the day of Jesus. You see, I needed him too. I needed a Savior God. I needed a God who would redeem me, who would bear my sins, who would set me free, who would take all the ugliness and the pain and the hurt and somehow make it all work out to the good for those who love him. Brothers and sisters, you have a good, good father. And I know that the road's not easy. But God can make it good. You have to stay close to the truth. You have to be firmly rooted in God's word. You have to be disciplined to hear the prompting of the spirit. You have to be, you have to listen. You have to surrender your human reason to the movement of the spirit. You have to listen to the new man in you. The spirit is talking to the new man in you and you need to listen. I said this in Bible class today. Either your faith, your new man, or your reason is going to rule, you pick. Isaac too often picked this to rule instead of this. If Isaac could do it over again, he would do a few things different. So would you. So would I. Let me leave you with this. Pastor Dave Gerber says often, God loves you so immensely and so passionately that there is nothing that you can do today to make him love you any less. But, but what about the flub-ups? He still loves you. Not one bit less. Not one bit degraded. He loves you because he made you, he created you, and you are unique, and you are special, and you are beautiful, and he just loves you. He gets giddy when you wake up. And hear me clearly when I say to you, there's nothing that you can do today to make him love you anymore. See, if somebody loves you absolutely, there is no less or more. It's just absolute. It's just certain. Along with me today, stand at the foot of the cross and look up for a second. Look up and ask him, why are you doing that? Because I love you. And may that be your sacred moment today. That you look at a dying Savior expending every bit of his love for you and for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in. For more messages and teachings, visit our website at www.firmlyrooted.org.